I have two stepdaughters. One stepdaughter has a very ordered life. In fact, if you want to visit, and I won't name her, if you want to visit her, you better make an appointment. And we have learned to have a rain date in case they can't make it. So we make a date for one Tuesday, and then we have a rain date for the next Tuesday, because my beautiful stepdaughter plans her life. She's also the one who sends you cards on time. She's also the one who plans her whole schedule for the year and is very orderly. In fact, she is the assistant for her husband who runs a multi-million dollar company. She is my stepdaughter that I am telling you about. I have another stepdaughter. She is a teacher. I'm going to cry. She has a heart of a cook. She cares. When you're there, she's there. She's with you when you're there. You can feel that she cares. And so, sometimes when you try to get together with her, on the doorstep, and she'd be there. I don't always get cards from her, although I did get flowers. And I thought I was always going to get flowers on Mother's Day, but this year they didn't come. Not even a card. I went to her house and I saw a card that was a Mother's Day card, but it was still sitting there, and I thought maybe before I leave she'll give me that card, but she never gave me the card. She's only got two. Mothers, you know, her mother, and I'm her stepmother. Now I'm going to ask you a question. Which daughter do you think I love the best? You might think that, but you know what? I love them both. And you love them both. And Jesus loves them both, those two sisters. I'm thinking, this sermon is not about Martha and Mary, by the way. But Mary said, Mary, Jesus said about Mary, there's only one thing worth being concerned about. Mary has discovered it, and it will not be taken away from her. Luke 10, 42. We each have our way of approaching God, don't we? We each have our way of approaching God. And God loves us Either way, just like my two stepdaughters approach me in different ways. And yet, God loves us that way. What's important is that we're going to learn a little bit today about rest and about come unto me. Mary went to the feet of Jesus and she listened. Now, they say that when you're giving a talk, one of the best ways to give a talk is to tell them what you're going to tell them before, and then tell them what you're going to tell them, and then afterwards tell them what you told them. <laughs> Have you ever heard that? Oh, you've heard that. Well, a person that I read a long time ago, his name is um, Sequera. What's his first name? Jack. Jack. Jack Sequera. I bet he's really charming and got called Jack. Isn't that weird? But Jack Sequeira wrote a book called, uh, about wonderful things about the Sabbath. And I read that book many years ago. And this song that we sang has a little bit to do with that idea that I understood that the Sabbath was not just a day, but it was part of belonging to Jesus. So I'm going to just read you some stuff that um, Jack Sequeira wrote. It's from his Key Points in Chapter 18, and it's called The Sabbath Rest. Number one, the Sabbath is more than a day of physical and mental rest. It is more even than a day of worship. The Sabbath has a redemptive significance, a distinct connection with the gospel. God set aside, number two, God set aside the Sabbath as a day of rest to signify his perfect and finished work of creation from Genesis. And God rested only when his work was perfect and complete. 
Adam and Eve, on the other hand, spent their first whole day of life resting on God's Sabbath, and only then did they take up their what? Their work. Number three, like creation, salvation begins by resting in the perfect, finished work of Christ, not by doing something. And number four, just as Christ finished creation at the end of the sixth day and rested on the seventh day, he also finished redemption on the cross on the sixth day, and he rested in the tomb on the seventh day. Number five, when sin came into the world, it destroyed God's original significance for Sabbath rest. Humanity rebelled against God and demanded to depend only on self. Mankind introduced his own rest day, Sunday, but his substitute could not point to a finished, perfect work, either of creation or redemption. Amen. Number six, the final showdown in the great controversy will take place between salvation by faith, symbolized by God's Sabbath, and salvation by works, symbolized by man's Sunday. And you know I was a Sunday keeper, whatever that means, when the Lord first brought me to him. Seven, all who receive the gospel by faith, once again, all who receive the gospel by faith, once again enter into God's saving rest, of which the Sabbath is a sign. Number eight, Anyone who is keeping the Sabbath in order to be saved is perverting the very nature of Sabbath rest. If we make Sabbath keeping a requirement for being saved, we are not entering into rest. We are not pointing to a finished, perfect work. We are making the Sabbath into a means of salvation by works, a burden. Number nine, in the final conflict, the issue will not be between two groups of Christians, or even between two rest days, but between two opposing methods of salvation. The conflict will be between the seventh-day Sabbath, signifying salvation by faith alone, and Sunday, signifying salvation by human effort. Number ten and last. When the two opposing methods of salvation come clearly into focus, the true importance of the, of the Sabbath will also be clearly seen. One more time. When the two opposing methods of salvation come clearly into focus, the true importance of the Sabbath, the Sabbath day, will also be clearly seen. And at that time, Sabbath keeping, of the seventh day of the week. He didn't say seventh day of the week, I said. At that time, Sabbath keeping will become a test of faith. At that time. So, the book was called Beyond Belief. Beyond Belief by Jack Sequera. Oops, I stepped out of the camera, I think. <laughs> I'm still here? Okay. I titled this um, study, Come Unto Me, because of this scripture that was read. Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart. And ye shall find what? Rest. rest unto your souls. So what's the opposite of rest? What is it? Rest. Unrest, and what would be another uh, word? I think I heard over here. Y'all have to talk loud enough for me. Work. work. Opposite of rest is work. Is it possible to have a work that you can do that is so enjoyable? And I'm looking at Marilyn. Marilyn is a painter. Marilyn is an artist. Marilyn, behind that screen, we have watched it all the time, the uh, picture of outdoors. Did you do that? Marilyn, you painted that. When you were doing that, what, how did the work feel compared to... Oh, what, I don't have a mic. I'm going to need a mic. It went very well. 
when you paint a painting, does it feel like work or what does it feel like? It feels like what? It was fun. It feels like fun. So even though you're creating something, it feels like fun. Hmm. So there is it possible to do something, make something that other people would call work that feels like rest? Yes, yes. I thought about you. This is planned, by the way. <laughs> so glad you made it. Hey, you, Patty Dove. I know you practice the piano at home, and I know you practice singing. Does that feel like, tell me what that feels like. We well, all know I love to sing and I love to play, so that's, whether I, I mean, I mess up all the time, but I don't care, I just love it. So does it feel like work? No, not, no. <laughs> not really, not work. So you're relaxing when you do that play. It's your therapy, she said. Hmm. So is it possible to do something that creates something, that makes something, and it doesn't feel like work? You're working, but you're resting while you're working? You're doing, but you're, you're at peace with it? Linda, you said it was the opposite of uh, rest could be unrest. We're going to talk about that. I think Paul really knew what he was talking about. What I've done up here is Hebrews, the fourth chapter, and it's in a New Living Translation. I just like it. So I thought we'd go some, do some verse by verse, but um, you also need to know, and Carl, I'm going to put you in charge. You also need to know that preaching, I get nervous, but if it's Sabbath school, I'm not nervous. So I said, why don't I do this like Sabbath school? It's weird, isn't it? Kind of different. But um, Hebrews, the fourth chapter, is about the prom promised rest for God's people. Now, if you read the third chapter, it's all about what? Who knows? Pardon? The son who was faithful. Oh, third chapter of Hebrews? Okay. Part of it is about the unbelief of um, the children of Israel, their unbelief and how they didn't uh, didn't actually enter into the state of grace that God wanted them to enter into. So this is where it starts in chapter 4. It says, God's promise of entering His rest still stands, so we ought to tremble with fear that some of you might fail to experience it. For this good news that God has prepared this rest has been announced to us just as it was to them, and them being the people of uh, Old Testament Israel. So what does it say we should be afraid of? We should tremble with fear that we would do what? We might fail to experience it. In other words, if, if, uh, if uh, well, let's just take Marilyn, for instance. If Marilyn was supposed to be given a job to create a mural, and now she just doesn't want to do it, it's no longer fun, she doesn't, she's not enjoying it, it can turn into a job. That is a different experience than what she said her other experiences, right? So we have to tremble with fear that some of us might fail to experience what? His rest. Entering into his rest. Well, this is the good news that God has prepared this rest, has been announced to us just as it was to them. So God has a rest for us. Let's go on to the next verse. But it did them no good because they didn't share the faith of those who listen to God. For only we who believe can enter his rest. As for the others, God said, in my anger I took an oath, they will never enter my place of rest. Some places say they didn't mix it with faith. Who, who can enter into God's rest, according to the scripture? Only who? Only they who believe, right? Only they who believe. So believing is one is the most important part about entering into this rest. Well, I wonder what we're supposed to believe. Let's see if I've got the right scripture up here. Um, Jesus told them in John chapter 6 and verse 29, what did he say? Jesus told them, this is the only work God wants from you. Believe in the one he has sent. What are we going to believe about Jesus? What, what was Jesus asking them to believe? 
about believe in the one he has sent. Just that I'm, I'm it. I'm the one. I'm the Messiah. Was that it? What was the Messiah supposed to do? He's a rescuer, right? He's a savior. He's a, pardon? An example. He's an example. And he's the one who ended up going to the cross, dying for us, being raised from the dead by the very power of God. And what? You could have a squirrel in the middle of the road that died. You're not going to get that squirrel back alive. What is the most amazing demonstration of God's power? Resurrection. The resurrection bringing something back to life that's dead. I mean, nobody but God does that. Nobody but God can do that. And so what we're going to do, believe in the one he has sent, we're believing a whole lot of things. We're believing one thing, that he actually took our sins with him. He took our sinful nature to the cross. We're believing that he uh, is the son of God, that he is divine. He said, I and my father are one. And if you have seen me, you have seen the Father. We're believing a lot of things if we just use the word believe, aren't we? And this is what Jesus said is your work. Now, how is that work? Work. Or is that work something that, that happens to you because you, you love him? And, and when you love something, when you love to do something or when you love someone, uh, it doesn't feel the same as work, does it? So Jesus said, this is the only work God wants from you. Believe in the one he has sent. Would somebody else look that up in a different version? Or if you have that version, uh, or a version, John 6, 29. John 6, 29, if you'd look that up. And we're going to find out what, what your version says. And it looks like Diana has it right behind you. Verse 26, Jesus answered them and said, Most, Go ahead, 26 through 29. I'm 29, I'm sorry. Uh, Jesus answered and said to them, This is the work of God, that you believe in him whom he sent. Okay, what was the verse just before that? What was the question that they had asked? Um, what shall we do that we may work the works of God? Hmm. And the answer is to believe in him whom he has sent. This is very important as we go through the rest of this part of Hebrews. Okay. Even though this rest has already has been ready since he made the world. How is that rest ready since he made the world? Well, let's look a little farther. Maybe he'll explain it to us. We know it is ready because of the place in the scriptures where, he meant, where it mentions the seventh day. On the seventh day, God rested from all his work. So, what was the state of the world after God created it? Very good. And it was perfect, right? It was it complete? Was it finished? Was there anything else God wanted to do to, to, do to it? Did he stand back and say, oh, man, I wish. Is that something we do? Amen. Is there ever a time when you finish a project and not said, oh, I wish I would have done that a little better? If you look at your stuff, your work, and you go, in fact, I used to sew, and when I would get done with something, if there was like, one time I made a sleeve, that, and I made it a way that it wasn't supposed to be, and I said, oh, i got to make another sleeve like the way I didn't make it over here, because i got to have two sleeves that don't follow the pattern, they're different than the picture looks, but i got to do it, because... And so then ever after when you put that on, you go, that's that dress where I made the sleeve like that on that side. And you can't forget it. You can't forget it. It's because you, is there anything you have ever made that was perfect, finished, and completed? Raise your hand. You got done with it and you always could see some room for what? Room for improvement, we call it, don't we? But with God... When he gets done with something, is there room, does he have to have room for improvement? He, what he makes is perfect. And so if he made salvation for us, or he made this rest, was it perfect? Yes. Ooh, it was perfect. And when did he make it? Way back at the beginning of the world. 
Now, sin has come in and corrupted it, but there was a rest that he made that was perfect. And that's the rest that he's asking us to enter into. Now, on the seventh day, God rested from all his work. Now, then, this other part, in the other passage, God said, they will never enter my place of rest. So God's rest is there for people to enter, but those who first heard this good news failed to enter because why? They disobeyed God. And what is disobedience any more than unbelief? Disobedience, unbelief. If you think about it, the work that we're supposed to do is believe that we God sent him. If you believe that, you're going to follow Jesus. And Jesus said, if you love me, you will what? You keep my commandments. You're going to reflect my character. We know that the commandments of God reflect the character of God, right? If God said, do not murder, what's the opposite of do not murder? Life, right? Life. If you, you, if you take away life or you give life, is God a life giver? All life comes from God. If God says, do not steal, what's the opposite of take, taking something from somebody? Giving something. Is God a giver? Yeah. yeah, God's a giver. So the reflection of God's character is in his Ten Commandments. What if, and we might, we might ask ourselves the question, thou shalt not commit adultery. What's the, what's the essence of the opposite of committing adultery? When someone is unfaithful to their spouse, God is faithful. Is God faithful? Yeah. He is faithful. So these commandments show us the character of God. What about thou shalt not covet? Thou shalt not covet. What is the opposite thing of me wanting something all the time? It could be giving or it could be just contentment. Being at peace, at rest, contentment, acceptance, attitude of gratitude. That could be the opposite of wanting what God gives us uh, in the 23rd Psalm, it says that you should, you know, you could, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not what? Want. Want. So when you're not coveting, you're reflecting the fact that God is the ultimate provider. And so this character of God that's reflected in his commandments even goes to the Sabbath commandment. Now, when we look at the Sabbath commandment, God's told us that even though you're only going to work six days a week and you're going to give me the rest of that day, literally, physically, with your time, I'm taking care of you. I'm a provider. I've done everything for you. That's physical. That's this life. That's food, drink, insurance, car payments, gasoline, all that stuff. God has said he would do that. But this other rest, this spiritual rest, this is the rest that they did not get because they disobeyed him. Because they didn't believe him. He said that he was going to take them into a, a country that didn't belong to them. He was going to wipe out, he was going to let them wipe out these other nations because his other nations were disobedient. He was going to give everybody a place to live. They're going to have a plot of land that would stay there, theirs, even if they were foolish and didn't know how to manage their money, they were going to get it back at the end of 50 years. Uh, the jewelry, they would, you know, even if they were like most human beings, don't know how to manage their stuff, God was saying, okay, well, I'm going to fix it up. I'm going to do all this for them, and they will have this place, and I've got these wonderful ideas and plans for them, but they murmured, they disbelieved, they didn't think God was going to do it, and they disobeyed. They disobeyed to the place where they even got little idols and things, and they said, well, you know, we're going to help God. We know we got this God of Israel, and he's providing this cloud and, and by day and fire by night, but we're going to have these little idols. And just, just to, keep, you know, make sure that we can have this all happen, we're going to say little prayers to them, offer little rice offerings or whatever. <laughs> so what does that mean? They disobeyed. They disbelieved. And they did that for the 40 years they were in the wilderness. Even though God kept trying to stir them up and grant them all these wonderful things. So, God's rest is there for people to enter. But those who first heard this good news 
failed to enter because they disobeyed God. So God set another time for entering his rest, and that time is today. Everybody say that time is today. Time is today. I'm saying that so you wake yourselves up. Your faces are hitting 12.05. <laughs> so that time is today. Are you happy? Is it good news? Yes. Is there a rest we can have? Is there something God wants us to do that, that will make like the work that we're doing for Jesus will seem like fun? We'll be like our time of relaxation, our time of therapy. We're getting to work for God. And we'll be, we'll be floating, happy. So God set another time for entering his rest, and that time is today. And God announced this through David much later in the words already quoted. Today, when you hear his voice, don't harden your hearts. And that's from Psalm 95, verse 7 through 8. That should be my prayer. Huh? Today, if I hear his voice, don't harden my heart. Now, if Joshua, he was the one after Moses that led the people of God through the, through the wilderness, right? Now, if Joshua had succeeded in giving them this rest, God would not have spoken about another day of rest still to come. So there is a special rest still waiting for the people of God. For all, this is, a, this is the key of the whole thing. This is why I read to you from Jackson Square at the beginning. This is where Jackson Square got this, from the Word of God. For all who have entered into God's rest have rested from their what? Labors. Labors, just as God did after what? Creating in the world. So, I like to talk about this as one of the commandments. I could say, you know, I want to show God how I love Him. I think I'm going to make a little plaque with a picture of Him on it. I'm going to hang it over the door. And every time I go through, I'm just going to do a little curtsy so He'll know that I love Him. Because I love Him. I want Him to know. Jesus died on the cross. Maybe, maybe I'll make another little cross. Get his, you know, get somebody to mold that up to put His body on there. And, Every time he goes by, oh, I'm gonna make a make a cross because I love him. I want to show him that because I love him. But Jesus gave me some instructions on how to love him, didn't he? He said not to make any graven images or bow down to them. And in Colossians it says that Jesus is the express image of the invisible God. So God knew that there was going to be a time when he would send his only begotten son to walk among us in the flesh, to take on the seed of uh, Mary, to take on our seed, this, even have a fallen human nature, and yet overcome in it, and that he would be here, and that at that time, after he got resurrected from the, he, the and he's back in heaven, the angels fall down and worship him. He is worthy of being worshipped. There's only one who's worthy of being worshipped, and that's God, right? Yes. And so he said, Deborah, I know you want to love me. I want to show my love, your love to me, but don't make any great images and bow down to them. I got a better plan coming up. I've got a living Savior who's going to come and show you what the invisible God's like, what he looks like, what he talks like, what he heals like, how he raises people from the dead. And how he was gentle with the children. I've got that plan coming. So here you go. All who have entered into God's rest have rested from their labors, just as God did after creating the world. There's a special rest waiting for the people of God. And that the King James says that there's a rest that remains unto the people of God. That word rest is actually a Greek word. That is the word Sabbath, Sabbatismos. There remains, therefore, a Sabbath to the people of God. Now, this is New Testament. This is Jesus has died, buried, resurrected, gone back to heaven. This is Hebrews written to the Jews. And he's saying there remains a rest unto the people of God. There remains a Sabbatismos. There remains a keeping of the Sabbath to the people of God. There remains a rest, a special rest, still waiting for the people of God. Now, when did that rest get made? We already talked about it. In the beginning, God made a perfect rest. It was a perfect work. 
And we've read about the Sabbath being a sign of our salvation, our redemption, and of creation. So this is a perfect work that God has made in the um, rest. For the, okay, you realize that that is like the most powerful thing that the New Testament has to say about the Sabbath. I know when I was uh, trying to decide whether I was going to keep the Sabbath, there was two, two texts.